Seeing none, it's now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Thank you for taking the PC caucus's advice and cancelling any future green energy contracts. But again, but again, Mr. Speaker, let's be clear. Just like the rebate announcement, today's announcement is just too little, too late. The government has plowed ahead for years signing contracts for energy we simply do not need. The Premier has become the best Minister of Economic Development that Pennsylvania and New York has ever seen, giving away our hydro at pennies on the dollar. Mr. Speaker, the Premier was wrong on green energy. She was wrong on OLG. Will she complete the hat trick today and acknowledge the government was wrong on the fire sale of Hydro One? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And let me uh, let me just go through the uh, the process here, Mr. Speaker. As uh, as this House well knows, we inherited an electricity system that had been badly neg neglected under the previous government, Mr. Speaker. There were brownouts and blackouts and smog days, Mr. Speaker, that put our economy and our people at risk. Um, we took that dirty, unreliable system, Mr. Speaker, that electricity system, and we've made it clean and reliable. We've invested in it. And and it's now one that all of us can count on, Mr. Speaker. We eliminated coal, the source of those smog days, that has saved $4 billion in health and related costs, Mr. Speaker. $4 billion because of this clean grid. As confirmed recently by the uh, independent electricity system operator, so the IESO has come and said, Mr. Speaker, that our investments have secured a strong, Answer. steady supply of clean power. And that, Mr. Speaker, is because of the investments that we have made, because of the decisions that we have Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Thank you, Speaker. So back to the Premier. So now with your back to the wall and on the road to Damascus, you've decided not to proceed with energy contracts that wouldn't happen till well into the future. But what you've admitted to the people of Ontario and what we've been saying for years is that you paid way too much for energy contracts all the way along. The people have been hurt by your contracting yep. for that unneeded energy. Right. The auditor has said $37 billion too much, that your energy contracts are the primary reason that energy Fair costs point. in this province are too high. So, will you commit to no further contracts signed under this government for energy we don't need? And will you to once again stand up for the right thing to do and stop any further sale of the shares of Hydro One? A reminder during debate, you uh, put your question and answer through the chair, only the chair. Um, in the event that it continues, I'll stop and consider passing the question. Premier. Mr. Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the honourable member for the question. I'm very pleased to be able to rise today and talk about our suspension of the LRP2 uh, program, Mr. Speaker. We're suspending the 1,000 megawatts to make sure that we can find ways to continue to reduce rates for electricity consumers right across the province. And though the recently announced LRP contracts, I know the minister. I'm quite prepared to move to what I did the last two days, and uh, the, the Thursday and uh, Monday. We'll do it again if we need to. That'll be my last uh, discussion about uh, heckling. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In terms of, of price, uh, the member talked about price. The, price. the price contracted for solar power represents the lowest cost for solar projects that have been contracted in Canada to date, Mr. Speaker. We have some yes, of the sir. lowest prices right across the country. And in terms of a plan from this party, Mr. Speaker, they have no plan. They have no plan when it comes to energy. Out of that office, Thank they you. don't even know if he's signing letters, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Uh, 
Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. Perhaps this change of heart has more to do with dollars for the Liberal coffers than it does anything else. We have this gift from Adrian Morrow of the Globe and Mail this morning, an email sent from Chris Benedetti, one of the biggest green energy lobbyists in the province, to some of his clients promoting a private fundraiser with, you guessed it, the Minister of Energy. The Premier told this House that all private fundraising events would be posted on the Liberal website, but when we searched the website this morning, there were no events listed for October 5th at the Peter Pan Bistro. Speaker, given the Minister's announcement this morning, Hello. affected no renewable contracts currently signed. I have to ask, will companies that have signed contracts be at this little get-together on October 5th? And what is the Premier going to do about ministers violating Christian. her phony rules about fundraising from stakeholders and keeping those meetings secret from the public? We will now move to warnings. And I'm not impressed with that kind of comment. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank you, the member for the advertisement for my fundraiser that's coming up that everyone knows about. But let's talk about fundraising, Mr. Speaker. The MPP for your Leeds Grenville on May 24, 2016, held a private fundraiser in Yorkville, marketing himself as the PC deputy leader of a tourism, culture, and sport critic. He also advertised Senator wow. Bob Runciman, and the chief opposition whip would be on hand. Cost. $1,300 for platinum supporters. The MPP for Lambton, Kent Middlesex. He is currently Finished, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. MPP for Huron Bruce held a private fundraiser at Rogers Centre, $600. Oh! Mr. Speaker, you know what? On this side yes, of the sir. House, we're going to worry about making sure that we find ways to lower rate for consumers. With the single largest electricity reduction bill in this province's Thank history, you. they don't have a plan. No question. The member from Leeds Grendel. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the government claims outrageous hydro bills are the price for a reliable electricity system. Try telling that to Brad Borland, franchisee at Canadian Tire in Gananoque. In 2013, Brad spent $69,000 on hydro and had zero power outages. This year, he'll pay $120,000, a 42% increase. So what does he get for that 42% increase, Speaker? Because there's been no investments in the Hydro One feed to Gananoque, he got seven blackouts. Wow. These outages wow. cost him $50,000 in lost revenue and damages, and that's just one business. The cost to the community was in the millions. So, Speaker, my question is, if the $10,000 a month Brad pays for Hydro isn't enough to keep the lights on, will the Premier tell me how much it will cost? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as the members of this House. Member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is warned. And if I know who that was, they would be warned. Finish, please. So, Mr. Speaker, as the members of this House well know, the previous government let, uh, left our electricity system in a state of disrepair. Our government spent more than a decade making it clean and reliable for Ontarians. We've already invested more than $15 billion in upgrading more than 15,000 kilometres of transmission and distribution. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. Finish. <laughs> Yet in recent days, Mr. Speaker, the opposition has begun to make some truly bizarre claims about our system's Answer. reliability, pointing to planned outages or weather-related outages as evidence, Mr. Speaker. Perhaps when the Leader of the Opposition Thank talks you. about outages, he's thinking about the dump truck. Supplementary. 
The member from Huron Bruce. Thank you, Speaker, my question is to the Premier. A small business owner in my riding recently wrote to me about how she and her husband invested half a million dollars in energy retrofits to reopen a grocery store because I'm sure you would agree every community deserves one. Yeah. Well, Speaker, their bills started at $3,500 a month, but in two short years, they have jumped to a staggering $6,000. Sure. The Energy Minister's announcement today does absolutely nothing Zero. to reduce the electricity bills that people already can't afford. It's just a desperate ploy. Sad. So, Speaker, what is the Premier going to do to make life more affordable for people of Ontario today? Here, here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our proposed legislation that we have before the House will actually make life more affordable for Ontarians. A 20 per cent reduction for families in rural and remote and northern communities like in my part of the province, Mr. Speaker, will actually have a significant savings for many families, Mr. Speaker. We are also seeing the elimination of the DRC. We, Mr. Speaker, we are doing many things to help families. Even the OESP program that is there to help low- and medium-sized income families, they can actually apply for this program and see an additional $75 a month, Mr. Speaker, that come off their bill. When you compile all the stuff that we've done in the last few months, Mr. Speaker, this is the single largest reduction that we have done for families when it comes to electricity bills in Ontario's province and Ontario's history, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud of what we've done, and unfortunately, they voted against it when we asked for unanimous to get this through the House. Final supplementary. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, your new talking points about reliability come from polling and have nothing to do with reality. The blackout tracker found the number of outages increased by 275 per cent just from 2012 to 2015. Lake Talon residents, residents in my riding experienced a 25-day power outage this spring. Mm -hmm. On their hydro bills, though, they were forced to pay the delivery charge for power they never received. Speaker, a month without the most basic necessities. In rural Ontario, without power, you can't pump water or flush a toilet. And what did Hydro One tell them regarding the loss of all the meat they harvested in their fall hunt? You shouldn't be Question. storing meat in your freezer. Speaker, I asked what does the Premier have to say about reliability to the people in Lake Tallinn? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So just last week, a dump truck hit a line near Windsor that caused a brief outage. Uh, trees blowed down by windstorms in Muskoka one of the days in August caused some homes to lose power for the day. So if the opposition has suggestions on how to prevent car accidents or weather, we're all ears, Mr. Speaker. But in the meantime, we on this side of the House know what real outages are. We remember 2003, the broad-scale rolling blackouts, which characterized the opposition's management of our electricity system, Mr. Speaker. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, these weren't small outages. These were blackouts that were put forward by a government that didn't invest in electricity system, didn't invest in generation and transmission. We have done that. We've cleaned up their mess, and we'll continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Liberal insiders are telling the media that the Premier is in favour of helping to sell off Toronto Hydro. Is that true? Thank you, Premier. We don't own it. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, um, the, uh, the leader of the third party will have to speak to the Mayor of Toronto and councillors if she wants to talk about Toronto Hydro. Supplementary. The Liberals are selling off Hydro One, and that means higher hydro bills. Now they're helping to sell off municipal hydro utilities like Toronto Hydro. We know from the FAO's release, the Financial Accountability Officer's release, that increasing bills are going to hit low-income Ontarians and northern and rural people the hardest. People can't afford the sell-off of Hydro One, Speaker, and they can't afford the sell-off of their local distribution company either. Are the Liberal insiders telling the truth that the Premier thinks it's a good idea to privatize hydro and that she is, quote, interested in helping make it happen. Thank you. Stop the clock. The Minister of Infrastructure is warned. Premier. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, the, uh, the initiative of this government to invest in transit and transportation infrastructure across this province, Mr. Speaker, is very important to the people of the province. It's important to communities across the province. And when we ran in 2014, Mr. Speaker, we said that we were going to look at the assets of, uh, of the government, Mr. Speaker, and we were going to work to leverage those assets so that we could invest in new infrastructure that would be owned by the people of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, there are infrastructure projects going on across this province. Roads, bridges, transit, hospitals, schools, Mr. Spilder, Mr. Speaker. There's building happening because we are making those investments. We cannot sit back and let infrastructure uh, deteriorate, Mr. Speaker. We have to make sure that we make those investments. And the fact Answer. that Ontario is uh, one of the leading jurisdictions for economic growth in the country, Mr. Speaker, has to do Thank with you. those very investments. Well, Speaker, Liberal insiders say that the Premier thinks helping to sell off Toronto Hydro would, quote, deflect some public anger away from the Liberals and their decision to sell off Hydro One. People are struggling to pay their hydro bills, and every increase will disproportionately hit low-income and rural and northern families. But instead of making the government priority affordable electricity, the Liberals' priority is to deflect public anger from themselves. Why does this Premier continue to make decisions, to behave, to act in the best interests of the Liberals instead of the best interests of the people of this province. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm solely in politics to work to benefit the people of this province, to make sure that the people of this province have the education system that they need, the health care system that they need, Mr. Speaker, that we rebuild the infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, that has served us for so many years, but we know needs renewal, renewal Mr. Speaker, and to make sure that people have a reliable electricity system, Mr. Speaker, and that we move to make sure that it is as affordable as possible. That's what the initiative in the throne speech was about, Mr. Speaker. It was about making sure that we take that provincial portion of the HST off electricity bills across the province, that we help further people in rural and remote communities to the tune of 20 percent reduction, Mr. Speaker, and that we work with small businesses, Mr. Speaker, and medium-sized businesses to make sure that they have a break as well, Mr. Speaker. That is about helping people in their lives every single day. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third Speaker, um, I can say that it uh, really doesn't show if that's, uh, if that's the Premier's uh, goal. Uh, but look, this, pre this question is actually to the, uh, to the Premier as well. People see that the Premier is making decisions that are about privatization, and those decisions are more based on the political interests of her party than what's best for people. That is totally obvious. They're based on, and I quote, deflecting anger. They're based on political cover. That's not what the people voted for, Speaker. That's not what the people asked for when they voted in the last election. People had hoped for so much better, and they are so disappointed in what they're getting from this government. So my question is one that's pretty straight up. Will this Premier come clean and let us know whether or not she is going to continue to facilitate the privatization Question. of more of Ontario's hydro system? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, um, the decisions that we make uh, as government are often very challenging, very complex, Mr. Speaker. And I said, as a pillar of our plan, that we would invest in infrastructure in this province, Mr. Speaker. So we made a difficult decision. It actually is kind of laughable that the leader of the third party suggests that somehow the decision around Hydro One was in our political interest, Mr. Speaker. It was a challenging decision. It was a practical decision. It was not an ideological decision, but it was a decision that will lead to and is already, meaning that we can invest in people's lives by providing them with the transit and the transportation options that they need so they can get home to their kids, so that they can pick up their kids from childcare, so that they can have time with their families, Mr. Speaker, that otherwise they would not be able to have. Start the 
Supplementary. Well, Speaker, what it was was the wrong decision. That's the decision it was. It was the wrong decision. People are worried about their future, people, uh, Speaker, and they're worried about whether their kids are going to be able to build a good life here in this province. But instead of making decisions that make life easier for people, the government is making it harder for people, especially low-income people who feel the burden the hardest when it comes to their increasing hydro rates, and for rural and northern Ontario families who are paying the very highest bills, Speaker. And the Premier's only concern is to, quote, Reflect some public anger away from Liberals. End quote. Now, people expected, and I have to say, Speaker, people deserved so much better than this. Will this Premier commit to stopping any further privatization, Question. whether it's local utility corporations or whether it's Hydro One? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the, the leader of the third party knows full well that the decisions that are made at the local level around utilities, those are their decisions, Mr. Speaker, and the, uh, the decision that is, uh, that is on the table in, uh, in the City of Toronto, the, the leader of the third party will have to speak with the people at Council and the Mayor at uh, the City of Toronto, Mr. Speaker. If the leader of the third party is asking whether we will stop investing in transit, Mr. Speaker, whether we will stop investing in transportation infrastructure across the province, Mr. Speaker, no, we will not. Those investments are needed. They're needed in order to create jobs right now, and that's what's happening. There are thousands of people working across the province, Mr. Speaker, because of those investments, and those investments are necessary into the future, because if we are going to compete globally, Mr. Speaker, we must have that modernized infrastructure in place, will draw business and allow businesses here to expand, Mr. Speaker. No, we're not going to stop making those investments. Speaker, the the Premier is not being clear. She knows very well that she has a role to play in facilitating the sell-off of local distribution companies. She knows that she has a role there, and for her to suggest she does not is not being upfront with the people of this province. People, Speaker, were surprised when the Premier announced that she was selling off Hydro One because it's not what they voted for. They didn't vote to sell off local distribution companies either, Speaker. So whether it's Toronto Hydro or whether it's any other local distribution company, people did not vote for privatization. They can't afford to pay more just to give the Premier political cover and deflect anger away from her Liberal government. So, Will the Premier stop all of the hydro sell-offs in the province of Ontario? Thank you. You it, please. You it, please. Thank you. The Minister of I was going to issue a warning, but maybe because of the response, I'm not going to. But I decided I'm going to issue the warning. The, the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Re Reconciliation is warned. New question. The member from Perry Salmon School. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. To the Premier. Hydro prices in Ontario are at a crisis level. Recently, Ian Cohoon, the owner of Axiom Audio, contacted my office saying, what is going on with Ontario electricity prices? Axiom Audio is a manufacturer of world-class speakers and audio equipment. The business is located in Dwight and employs 20 people in the town of 200 east of Huntsville. Axiom competes for business worldwide. Ian sent me his hydro bill, and in June, his cost for electricity was $973, but the delivery charge amounted to $2,127. The total cost of electricity for the month amounted to over 39 cents per kilowatt hour. And remember, this is June. Speaker, how can the Premier expect a rural manufacturer, manufacturing business to continue to operate in the province of Ontario with hydro rates that are so high and getting higher? That's Minister Hannah. Uh, stop the clock. I made a, uh, I, I made a omission, and, and I apologize to the House. 
Um, I will follow the two supplement there the two, two questions and two answers and come back to the premier to answer the question that was put by the leader of the third party should the premier wish it. Minister of uh, Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the honourable member for the question. I hope the member told him about our plan with the ICI program that can save him up to 34 per cent of his bill directly on the delivery charge, Mr. Speaker, because right now, Mr. Speaker, it's important for us to ensure that businesses are aware of the savings that they can make because our industrial electricity rates in Ontario are extremely competitive with other Canadian and American jurisdictions, with the prices in northern Ontario in particular among the five five most affordable jurisdictions in North America. He can make savings of up to 34 per cent, Mr. Speaker. I do hope that that honourable member will ensure that he lets those companies know, Mr. Yes, Speaker. Sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from, member from Holdman, uh, Brent, Holdman Norfolk. Well, Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. I have a fellow in my riding, Walter Mueller, Jr. He's installed energy-efficient appliances, lighting, new heating, air conditioning. He has an on-demand water heater. He's never home during uh, on-peak hours. He does everything right, yet he gets a monthly electricity bill of over $400, and people want to know why, why is that. This gets worse. Mr. Mueller's family business, Springer Meats, pays 40 grand a month for electricity. Last year, it was $30,000 a year. No increase in sales, but a 30 per cent increase in expenses. Will the Premier please explain to this House how can people stay in business, let alone establish exactly. new businesses, Question. 30 per cent annual hydro hikes? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I do thank the honourable member for that question. When it's coming to the individual's home, um, there's an 8 per cent saving coming to all families right across the province. But what makes this even more spectacular, Mr. Speaker, and a significant savings for family are those families in the rural and remote areas of our community and in the northern parts. They can save 20 per cent, Mr. Speaker, with that money going directly on the delivery charge. When it comes to uh, the business component of the question that uh, the honourable member asked, if this individual qualifies for the ICI program, they can save up to 34 per cent on their bills. If not, he's, if he's a small business, he will also be receiving that 8 per cent reduction, plus some of the other programs that we have out there, Mr. Speaker. We're doing it for uh, the families because we recognize that some families, Mr. Speaker, are having a difficult time. But you know what, Mr. Speaker? We had to make sure that we built a safe, reliable and clean system after they left the system in tatters, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I'll turn to the Premier for a response. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the uh, leader of the third party was asking whether uh, whether I would intervene in decision making at uh, a local level in a in a unilateral way, Mr. Speaker. And I just want to comment that uh, one of the reasons that uh, I got involved in politics, and I know that actually there are a number of members who were municipal uh, elected officials, Mr. Speaker, right. mayors, who had lived through the experience of having a provincial government that imposed decision making on, uh, on local governments, Mr. Speaker, that amalgamated, Mr. Speaker, that didn't consult with, that didn't work with municipalities. And, Mr. Speaker, I have a very different modus operandi. And you know the, the members opposite talk about uh, green energy. Mr. Speaker, when I became the Premier, one of the first things I did was work with our Minister of Energy to make sure that we changed the process yes, around the siting of, uh, of wind turbines. So, Mr. Speaker, I believe in working with local governments, Mr. Speaker, rather than acting unilaterally. The question, the member from Toronto, Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Today, Ontario's financial accountability officer reported that people living in rural and northern Ontario see more of each paycheck go into paying their energy bills. Low-income people spend three and a half times more of their income on energy bills than the wealthiest Ontarians. Selling Hydro One is only going to push those rates higher. Opening up local hydro utilities to privatization is only going to push up those rates higher. For a lot of people living in rural and northern Ontario or people living on a low income, they already feel like they're at a breaking point. And if bills go higher, their kids won't be able to afford a better life. Will the Premier commit to no more sell-offs of the hydro system? Question. Thank you. Mr. 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 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to uh, thank the honourable member for this question. Of course, uh, you know I hope he's referring uh, all of the rural customers to the 20% reduction that we've brought sure forward in our in our bill. But let's not forget about all the other programs that we have in place, Mr. Speaker. We made sure that we got rid of the debt retirement charge, Mr. Speaker. That's no longer on the the bills for our consumers. And let's make sure that we have six programs. The OESP program is one that I would encourage the honourable member to in, encourage individuals to contact their local utility. But when it comes to the financial accountability officer, Mr. Speaker, oh, yes. the FAO report this August confirmed the average family in Ontario spends less on electricity than in every other province except British Columbia. And when it comes to total home, home energy costs, Ontario is in the middle of the Of the two of you, one of you has got a warning and the next one's out. Finish, please. So what's remarkable about these findings is that Ontario has already done the heavy lifting in modernizing our energy Answer. infrastructure and transitioning off of coal generation, Mr. Speaker. We continue to find ways to reduce costs Thank for cons consumers. Thank you. Supplementary. I can only think, Speaker, that the other side didn't hear the question, so I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase it. Over and over, people say they want the next generation to be able to build a better life. But for too many people, they feel like their bills are making that almost impossible. To quote the FAO, household home energy spending is a greater burden for lower income households. Rural and northern families and low income families feel every increase. Taking the HST off hydro is a first step, but it can't be the only step to getting bills under control. Stopping the sell-off has to be the next step. Will the Premier commit to ending the sell-offs of the hydro system? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We continue to find ways to reduce uh, energy costs for consumers right across the province. And today's announcement of uh, suspending and cancelling the LRP2 program, Mr. Speaker, will save uh, families additional 245 off of their bill, Mr. Speaker. But in terms of, of broadening ownership of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, we've done this, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we can continue to do what Ontario families want: to create growth and to create jobs, Mr. Speaker. And I was in the great riding of North Bay and Capuchin to make announcements of infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, that's going into these communities. And that's thanks, Mr. Speaker, in terms of broadening Hydro One. We will continue to do what's best for families on this side of the House while they just shake their fist, Mr. Speaker. Thank, thank you. you very much. Well, thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Now, intermittent sentences have existed in Ontario since 1972. And these are sentences that convicted persons serve typically in periodic intervals, typically on weekends. Intermittent inmates can contribute to overcrowding in our correctional centres beginning on a Friday night when they enter the system for the weekend sentences. So Ontario's first dedicated facility for such inmates opened in Toronto at the Toronto Intermittent Centre in 2011 as part of the Toronto South Detention Centre. Speaker, the minister was in London recently for the opening of Ontario's second dedicated facility for offenders serving intermittent sentences. And so through you, Speaker, can the minister please tell us more about this new facility and what it will mean for Ontario Question. and in particular for the Elgin, Middlesex, London area? Thank you, Minister. Community Safety and Personal Services. Good question. Thank you uh, very much, Speaker. I want to thank the member uh, from Beaches East York uh, for the question. I was certainly uh, pleased to speak recently at the opening of our new 112-bed regional intermittent centre on the grounds of the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre in London. It is indeed the uh, second intermittent centre built in Ontario and part of our regional intermittent strategy across the province. The goal is to ease pressures in relation to capacity when inmates enter facilities by building standalone intermittent centres on the site of existing facilities. However, it also uh, has a number of other benefits, including increased security by reducing the potential for contraband and weapons to be brought into the main facilities on those grounds by weekend offenders. The $9.3 million investment by our government was built with an innovative design to lower costs and will help significantly to reduce overcrowding at the Elgin Middlesex Detention Answer. Centre. It was a key part of our government's transformation strategy for corrections, and we all, I'll have more to say in the Thank supplementary. You. supplementary. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the minister for his description of this new facility. Just another example of how we're using assets to build Ontario up. And I'm pleased to hear about the numerous benefits of this new intermittent centre and the impact it will have on the London and surrounding areas. I'm also quite pleased at the reception the facility has received. I understand, for instance, that OPSU's expressed president has expressed deep satisfaction with the opening of the new facility, saying it will go a long way to improving conditions at the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre. OPSU President Smokey Thomas noted, and I quote, with the new RIC, the province just got a little bit safer. The chairman of the local community advisory board also commended the new facility, saying that the RIC will make Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre a much safer place. But these improvements at the Elgin Middlesex Centre aren't limited yes, to just this new facility. Can sir. the minister explain, talk about the other improvements that have been made to the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre? Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Speaker, I'm happy to speak about the other improvements that we've made, again, to the member from Beaches East York. I'm pleased uh, with the reception uh, that OPSU and others have, uh, have responded with. And uh, we've hired, Speaker, uh, 60 additional correctional officers since 2013 at this particular centre, with 12 more set to graduate from our uh, correctional officer training assessment program, who will be scheduled to work at this location uh, by the end of the month. The EMDC also now has a mental health nurse and seven full-time nurses on site with 24-hour nursing coverage. We've added uh, approximately 350 new cameras, security cameras, six additional metal detectors, and a full X-ray body scanner uh, will be present in 2017. Speaker, I'm pleased with the progress we're making in corrections. I want to thank the former minister, Minister Nackby, Superintendent Dave Wilson, and all of thank the frontline officers at the EMDC. The question, the from Hirschberg, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. My constituent, Nicola Hart, lives on a fixed income, so she doesn't heat her home with electricity. She burns wood to save money. Yet after Nicola pays for the roof over her head and her electricity bill, she comes up short every month. This is a nightmare facing many ratepayers in Bruce Gray Owen Sound, where 60 families have been disconnected because they couldn't pay their rising hydro bills. Nicola Hart fears she could be next. She owes Hydro One $20,000. This government broke its promise to protect consumers. It broke its promise to provide lower rates, and it broke its promise of a reliable supply of new electricity. Given all of these broken promises, given all of the ongoing bungling, tell me, tell me why anyone would, should trust this premier to fix the hydro rates that her party created. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the honourable member for that question. He uh, highlights uh, one individual case that that is uh, that is uh, difficult for that family and, and that individual. And I know when I was uh, meeting uh, with the executive director of Bruce County, we specifically spoke about about that case. And there there some are there are some anomalies in there, Mr. Speaker. But you know, in terms of, of disconnections, our, our government is committed uh, to ensure that we're going to keep that clean and affordable system or clean and reliable system and make it as affordable as possible. So that's why we brought forward many of those programs, Mr. Speaker. In terms of individuals that, that are facing disconnection, if they contact the LEAP program, Mr. Speaker, through their local utility, they can get a $600 instant rebate on that, Mr. Speaker. That may have helped that family before it got into such a crisis, Mr. Speaker. And then, of course, Mr. Speaker, we're yes, ensuring that we have that 20 percent reduction specifically for um, northern and rural families, Mr. Speaker, because we Thank recognize you. that some families have difficulty. Thank Thank you. Supplementary Minister First Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, back to the Premier. Speaker, if the cost of hydro suddenly matters to her, it's fair to ask what changed. It's no wonder hydro costs so much. They spent billions of dollars putting up unwanted wind turbines to produce power the province did not need, and they ran roughshod over rural Ontario. But who finally got this government to pay attention to hydro rates? Scarborough. So I ask the Premier, will the Liberals start listening to my constituents, or do they have to take up residence in Scarborough? Minister, I did what? 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the uh, honourable member for the question. I think we uh, need to uh, thank the honourable uh, minister of infrastructure for his past work on this file, Mr. Speaker, because he recognized that we can make savings by not building two new nuclear units, Mr. Speaker, saving $15 billion to the ratepayers. We actually saved $3.7 billion, Mr. Speaker, by not uh, by renegotiating our Samsung agreement and the 2013 long-term energy plan, Mr. Speaker. When we did a price renewal on our, our renewables, Mr. Speaker, we saved an initial $4.0 billion, Mr. Speaker, and that was all by his leadership. And Mr. Speaker, I'm very happy to come forward today and bring forward a plan where we are going to actually suspend and cancel the long-term uh, the, the LRP2, Mr. Speaker. That'll save an additional $3.8 billion, and that'll save more money for families right across this province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, today, I will be reintroducing my private member's bill to provide paid leave for workers who have experienced domestic violence and sexual violence, a bill that received unanimous support when it was debated in the last session. Speaker, it's traumatic enough for someone who has been sexually assaulted or abused by their intimate partner. Survivors should not also have to worry about losing their jobs because of the violence they experienced. The Premier can commit today to helping people maintain employment and making life a little easier by including paid leave for domestic violence and sexual violence in the government's Employment Standards Act changes. Will she do that? Thank you. Responsible for women's issues. Minister responsible for women's issues and accessibility. Thank you, Speaker. I think we can all agree domestic violence is a very serious problem. It crosses every social boundary, and it will not be tolerated in Ontario. And as the minister responsible for women's issues, it's a priority for me that women feel safe in their homes, in their workplaces, and in their communities. And I know the Minister of Labour will want to provide additional details from a, a Labour point of view in the supplementary, but let me just say this, Speaker, that in 2015-16, we've invested over $4.6 million in programs and services to help victims of domestic violence, and since releasing our Domestic Violence Action Plan in 2014, the Women's Directorate has implemented many initiatives to Answer. raise awareness of domestic violence and strengthen support for victims. We've taken strong action in our Sexual Violence Thank Action you. Plan. I know the Minister of Labour will speak Thank you. Much. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, recently we learned that the federal Liberals are looking at the provisions of my bill to allow workplace accommodations for federal workers. We know from the murders of Lori DuPont and Theresa Vince that violence often follows victims to the workplace. The ability to change hours of employment or transfer to a new location can literally mean life or death. Will the Premier follow the lead of her federal cousins and implement workplace accommodations for Ontario workers who have experienced domestic violence or sexual violence. Thank you, Minister. Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to uh, the member for that very important question. And thank you for bringing forward this private oh. member's bill. Yeah. We clearly understand, and I think both caucuses share the importance of this issue. We know the impact it has on individuals, on family, on children. Let me tell you, Speaker, in the province of Ontario, our Occupational Health and Safety Act is the only legislation of its kind in the entire country that requires employers in this province to take every precaution reasonable in the circumstances Absolutely. to protect a worker from domestic violence seriously. in the workplace and at home, Speaker. Speaker, this is an issue that's been brought to the attention of the Changing Workplaces Review. We're at the interim report stage. It's clearly discussed in that report, Speaker. So thank you for bringing attention to it. I look forward to working with the entire House to uh, resolving this issue. Issue in the right way, Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister responsible for Seniors Affairs. Uh, Ontarians are living longer and healthier lives, and many of Ontario's seniors want to continue being active and engaged in their communities. We see through the many community groups that are active in Etobicoke Lakeshore and in ridings throughout the province of Ontario. 
These groups are integral parts of our communities and work to provide seniors with a space to share and learn and opportunities to enjoy new and exciting experiences. Mr. Speaker, when the Seniors Community Grant was developed in 2014, it opened doors for many of these groups to expand their programs and offer unique experiences to Ontario seniors. It's been a successful program. And Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Seniors Affairs inform the House about the current status of the Seniors Community Question. Grant Program? Thank you. Minister responsible for Seniors Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to begin by thanking the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for his question about seniors' community grants. And as the minister responsible for seniors, I also want to take a minute to welcome all of the seniors in the gallery today. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, these. These grants, which have been in place since 2014, have provided Ontario seniors access to 700 different types of programs. The programs range from education, arts, culture, and healthy living, and focus on, sen on making sure seniors feel included and encouraging volunteerism. To get an idea, Mr. Speaker, of the reach of this program, consider these numbers. Since 2014, these grants have touched the lives of a quarter Answer. of a million Ontario seniors, and this year we expect the grants to touch the lives of another 142,000 seniors. Mr. Speaker, thank, the, you. thank you very much. Please supplement it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for her answer. And as we're building Ontario up and investing in our people, that's not just youth and students, it also includes our seniors. And seeing nearly 700 projects across the province receiving these grants is an amazing accomplishment. These projects are strengthening communities throughout Ontario. And by supporting these local grassroots organizations and giving them flexibility in their programming, the grant allows these organizations to develop projects that best fit the unique needs in their communities. However, Mr. Speaker, I wonder whether this grant benefits Indigenous and multicultural seniors as well as seniors outside of urban centres in the same way. So this grant is an excellent way of providing seniors with opportunities. Question. And I want to ask, uh, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Seniors Affairs whether she can inform how the seniors' community grants are helping multicultural, indigenous, and rural seniors. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's a very important question, and I'm delighted to answer that question. Here are some examples, Mr. Speaker, of the diverse communities that we are reaching. Thanks to the seniors' community grants, Indigenous elders in Little Current on Manitoulin Island will be working with students to create a local story guide booklet, opening communication and sharing histories across generations and communities. In Kitchener-Waterloo, Aging with Pride is training LGBTQ seniors to help facilitate workshops to raise awareness of their special needs and concerns. And in Ottawa, Mr. Speaker, the Ottawa Chinese Canadian Heritage Centre is offering 10 monthly lectures to Chinese seniors, teaching them how to manage everyday issues. These are just three examples, Mr. Speaker, Answer. of the diversity of programs. And I do want to say, Mr. Speaker, that this program has been so singularly successful that in Thank two you. years we have increased funding fourfold. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. The member from Sunderland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, to you and through you to the Minister of Energy. Families in Sarnia Lambton can't afford their hydro bills. Thousands of families in my community are in arrears. Residents have been bringing hydro bills to my office that are six, seven, eight hundred dollars per month. Wow. Local service agencies and nonprofits and service clubs are struggling to keep their doors open. Small business and local industry are powering down investment and expansion plans because they fear this government's policies. True. Billions of dollars in investment and economic impact are at stake in Sarnia Lambton. Minister, your 8% rebate is just a Band-Aid solution that won't stop the bleeding. Rates are still going up. Minister, when will you announce real relief for hydro rate increases for the families and businesses in Sarnia Lambton who struggle to pay or simply can't afford their energy? Good question. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the honourable member for his question. I was just in the, the great riding of Sarnia a few weeks ago, Mr. Speaker, working with Union Gas and learning about the Don Hub. And I have to tell you, Mr. Speaker, it's a great community, and there's lots of investment going on, and there's lots of businesses growing in that sector. So I know he should be very proud of that, Mr. Speaker, because the investments that we're making in terms of helping small businesses, Mr. Speaker, that 8 percent reduction will actually help many small businesses. And if they actually use more than a megawatt of power, Mr. Speaker, over a thousand more businesses right across the province will actually now be able to participate in the ICI program, Mr. Speaker. And the ICI program does one, two things, Mr. Speaker. The first thing it does, Mr. Speaker, it helps lower rates for these businesses between 14 and 34 percent, Mr. Speaker. That's one third. And also, Mr. Speaker, the ICI program actually reduces the amount of usage during our peak yes, time, sir. which actually helps the entire system, Mr. Speaker, which keeps rates lower for everyone, Mr. Speaker. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Supplementary, the member from Stormont, Dundas, and South Glenbury. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier. Residents and businesses in Stormont, Dundas, and South Glengarry are struggling to keep their heads above water because of unaffordable hydro bills. Mom and pop shops in small towns are being forced to close because they can't afford to keep their coolers on. One such store owner, the hydro bills were over $4,300 a month. He'll be forced to close after 30 years in service. Residents are in dire financial straits and are facing disconnections due to sudden increases, and they can't afford them, especially on fixed incomes. My question to the Premier is simple. She knows what's causing this hardship across the province. And today's announcement does nothing for my riding. Will she commit to stopping the construction of the four unaffordable wind and solar projects in Stormont, Dundas, and South Dundas? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Today's announcement is good news for consumers right across the province, Mr. Speaker. We've actually reduced $3.8 billion, Mr. Speaker, by actually suspending the LRP2 project. That's an additional $2.45 a month, Mr. Speaker, on average for every family. When you put that in conjunction with our three-point plan, Mr. Speaker, in terms of making sure that there's an 8 percent reduction for all families across the province, if you actually take that in consideration with the 20 percent reduction that rural and northern families are going to see, Mr. Speaker, and the ICI program with businesses, and then if you put that on top of reducing the debt retirement charge, Mr. Speaker, wow. and the six programs that we have, we are doing the single largest reduction in electricity bills for families in this province's history, Mr. Speaker. On the other side, Mr. Speaker, all they did was leave our system in shambles. Answer. We had to rebuild it, and we've got a safe, clean, and reliable system, and we're taking it to the next level to make it as Thank affordable you. as can be for everyone. No question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, I met with um, students at Brock University in St. Catharines. I met a young woman who is uh, at work nearly every single hour that she's not studying in class. She has worked all summer. She's earning the minimum wage. And she says that even with working all of the possible hours she can work, Speaker, her debt continues to grow. She is stressed out and she's exhausted. Education should be an investment speaker, not a burden. The government shouldn't be making money off of her debt. Will the Premier agree today to take the interest off Ontario student loans? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, it's interesting to hear a question like this coming from uh, the party that voted against helping uh, oh, more Ontario yeah. students yeah. to go to college and the university, Mr. Speaker, with free tuition. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, that you know I agree with the uh, member opposite that that uh, college tuition and university tuition should be accessible, Mr. Speaker. It should be accessible to everyone across the province, which is why we don't want students to be incurring that kind of debt in the first place, which is why the Ontario Student Grant, Mr. Speaker, which will be in effect next September, September 2017, will mean that uh, Young students, students from uh, low and middle, low middle income families, Mr. Speaker, will have uh, free tuition or better than free tuition, Mr. Speaker. And it's surprising to me that the uh, the leader of the third party Answer. wasn't supportive of that initiative. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Speaker, I think we all know that Ontario can be a great place to live, but it is getting harder and harder to build a good life here, especially for young people. Speaker, College or university should be a jumping-off point for finding a good job, finding a job you love, and building a great life. But graduating with a $30,000 loan plus interest makes it a lot harder to build that life. Speaker. This government should not be profiting from student debt, from student loans. It should not be happening. Does this Premier agree that it's time to take the interest off of Ontario's student loans? Well, Mr. Speaker, I asked the Leader of the Third Party if she thinks it's a good idea that students not have those debts in the first place, that they actually have access yeah. to grants, Mr. Speaker, that would mean that they wouldn't carry those loans. So, Mr. Speaker, what we have done is we have made a change, a, a dramatic change in the way uh, support for students, post-secondary students in this province will work starting in September 2017. Students from low and uh, low middle income families, Mr. Speaker, will have access to free or greater than free tuition, Mr. Speaker, and students from higher income will continue to benefit from the 30 percent off tuition, Mr. Speaker, but the students at most risk, the uh, students that apparently the leader of the third party is most concerned about, will have access to free tuition. I would think, Mr. Speaker, that that is something that the leader of the third party would support. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. There are many newcomers arriving to my riding of Scarborough Asian Court who are highly skilled and often possess a post-secondary education. I understand your ministry assists our highly skilled newcomers to access employment in the field of discipline without duplicating the previous training and education. In Scarborough Asian Court, a number of my constituents rely on programs to provide training and support in various professions. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can she share with us what programs within her ministry have to assist this highly skilled newcomers succeed in Ontario. Great. Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the dedicated MPP for Scarborough Aging Court for this valuable question. The member is correct. Ontario's immigration strategy has helped our province attract highly skilled newcomers to drive our economy forward and be competitive in today's global markets. Speaker, each year, over 6,000 highly skilled immigrants wow. access our bridge training projects and more than 100 occupations to help them find work in their designated professions. Some of these occupations covered by our bridge training projects include early child education, the skilled trades, and nursing. And I know that the MPP for Scarborough Aging Court is a nurse. Through this program, highly skilled newcomers are able to get licensed to support their families and contribute to Ontario's success. I want to thank the minister for her response. It is reassuring to know that our government is committed to helping newcomers to succeed. And I'm sure the minister would agree with me that the work of community agencies like the Chinese Professional Association of Canada, better known as CPAC, in my writing of Scarborough Asian Court, is critical to the success of newcomers. Minister, it is important that we continue to encourage highly skilled newcomers across Ontario to access these programs so that they can find meaningful work within their field of disciplines. Recently, the minister uh, announced a Seneca Newham Canvas in the City of Toronto, new funding for Ontario bridge training projects. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can she inform the House how the Government of Ontario is enhancing the support for various organizations across the province so that they can continue to help newcomers succeed in Ontario? Thank you. Minister. I want to thank the member once again for her question. Our government has stayed true to our commitment to support highly skilled newcomers in Ontario. In early August, I announced an investment of $3.35 million over the next two years for 11 new projects by nine organizations across Ontario. I am proud to say that one of the recipients is the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, OSPE. They will be receiving up to $369,000 to help develop a communication and workplace culture course for internationally trained engineers. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to programs like bridge training, training because when newcomers succeed in Ontario, Ontario succeeds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. New question. 
The member from Carlton, Mississippi Mills. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Exorbitant electricity bills mean that many Ontarians have fallen into energy poverty. Meanwhile, the Liberals are giving their cronies plum jobs and paying them bloated salaries. David Hurley is the man who co-chaired the Premier's election campaign. The Premier has rewarded him with contracts in which he bills taxpayers an unbelievable $420 an hour. How does the Premier justify granting him millions of dollars worth of government contracts? How does she justify paying her Liberal friends massive salaries when 567,000 Ontario families are in arrears on their hydro bills and 60,000 families have had their hydro cut off? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm uh, very pleased to rise and, and talk about the great work that we've done, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to building a safe and clean and reliable system, uh, Mr. Speaker. But what we're doing now, Mr. Speaker, is making sure that we've got a system that's in place that's affordable for as many as Ontarians as we can make it, Mr. Speaker. We're investing 8% uh, of rebate that every family will see right across the province on their electricity bills. And if you live in a rural or remote or northern community like where I come from, Mr. Speaker, many of those families will see a 20% reduction, Mr. Speaker. So we're making sure that we're finding ways to continue to reduce the rates. Today's announcement, Mr. Speaker, I was very proud to make the announcement because we're talking about making sure that our system stays clean and reliable and safe and that we're also suspending and cancelling the, uh, the LRP2, Mr. Speaker, which will continue to save families money right across this province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. And back to the Premier. Evidence mounts each and every day that this government's priorities are not Ontarians' priorities. Just like my colleagues from all parties in this House, I hear from constituents every day about out-of-control costs. Speaker, mothers and fathers in tears who must decide between whether they can feed their families or keep the lights on is unacceptable. Does the Premier really believe that ratepayers don't know when they're being bribed with their own money? And will she finally stand? Um, stop the clock. I'm going to be cautious about this. That uh, that phrase is uh, uh, unacceptable. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. Withdraw, Speaker. Finish your question, please. Thank you. And will she finally stand in this legislature and admit that her government has failed Ontario families? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, making sure Ontario families get the single largest electricity bill rebate in Ontario's history is something that we're very proud of, Mr. Speaker. And that's why we've taken action, Mr. It is uh, never too late to receive a warning. I'm looking at two people in particular, actually. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And so that's why we've taken action and introduced the Ontario Rebate for Electri Electricity Consumers uh, Act, a set of initiatives which add to many of our pre-existing programs for helping customers using their bills, Mr. Speaker. And, and we also know that there, we're particularly focusing on ensuring that vulnerable customers have the resources to help avoid disconnection, Mr. Speaker. Through powers from the province, the Ontario Energy Board has implemented enhanced consumer protection rules that all local distribution companies must follow, including Mr. Answer. Speaker, requiring a minimum 10 days advance notice of disconnection with accompanying resources to help customers in arrears, Mr. Speaker. Oh. We continue to do the right thing for families, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The member from the team, Carlton, on a point of order. I just uh, wanted to uh, wish, on behalf of my colleagues in the PC caucus, a happy birthday to our colleague Jeff Urich. He's a little bit younger than the finance minister, but it should be a great day for him. Thank you. Member from Perry Sound, Muskoka, on a point of order. Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to uh, correct my record. In my question, I had stated that uh, Axiom Audio's hydro bill electricity cost all in cost was over 39 cents a kilowatt hour. I, in fact, missed some of the charges. The actual cost is 44 cents oh. per kilowatt hour. Oh. 
the uh, member from Prince uh, for for Prince Edward Hastings on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to correct my record earlier in my uh, question during question period. Uh, I pointed out that the fundraising event for industry insiders with the Minister of Energy wasn't on the Liberal website. 45 minutes after I asked the question, the event is actually publicized. Yeah. That is not a point of order, and indeed, I will remind somebody that it is never too late to be warned. Never. And for that matter, me. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.